Holy One, give us wisdom to discern your word as we listen this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As you know, we're listening to some of the favorite hymns, and that is one of my favorites. I think some of you know when I was in Toronto, I was rector of a church with a lot of people from the Caribbean, and boy, we would belt out that hymn in the morning. <laughs> Last week, we looked at some of Jesus' I Am statements, uh, reflecting on eternal life and resurrection. Our faith in Christ is the beginning of eternal life, continues into the future after death, and will eventually take the form of resurrection when Jesus will come again. And I spoke of the time immediately after death, maybe some refer to that as heaven or paradise, with being with Christ, and yet there's more to come. And I voice questions, maybe a question that's on your heart. Well, how do I know? How do I know if I'm saved? How do I know if someone I love has been or will be saved? And these questions stayed with me throughout the week. And a verse that kept coming to me was one in Romans 10. And it's the same verse that you'll find in uh, Joel chapter 2. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What we cannot do is reduce scripture so that effectively we are saying, well, it doesn't really matter how we live now because we're all going to be saved. Because that is not what scripture is saying. Otherwise, it would make Christ's death and resurrection meaningless. And if you are worried about whether you have been saved, I suggest the fact that you're even worried about it suggests that you have. Otherwise, why would you care? <laughs> but as for others, we don't know. We don't know the deepest call in their heart right up to that moment of death. We simply don't know. But God knows. And the Father's, Father's desire is to save and not to destroy. He loves us and the ones we love and the ones who are a little difficult, far, far, far more than we ever could. But we need to be careful of thinking of our faith as an insurance policy, because it doesn't mean that those we love and those we pray for will be spared from suffering or spared an early and tragic death. A few weeks ago, I, heard, I was speaking to my friends in Toronto. Um, he's a pastor of the church, and his wife was telling me about the new priest who was coming. He was a, a young man. They just had a little girl. Um, he studied at the, uh, the Wycliffe College, where I studied. And they were out in uh, Manitoba um, visiting his wife's parents before they moved back to Toronto. One morning, they were traveling for breakfast when a moose leapt out in front of them, and he swerved to miss, uh, to miss the moose, but the car went plunging down an embankment. And as they went down, she said she realized that she was headed straight for a tree. The tree was on her side. And so he swerved, the husband swerved, to save his wife's life and that of the baby. But he died, but has everlasting life. He died but has everlasting life. Our faith does not protect us from the hurts of this world, from the ravages of sin, though I suspect we are protected much more than we actually know. So we are encouraged to pray and to hold up our beloved ones. And in the face of that terrible grief and the grief and tragedies that we face, there's no answer. There's nothing that can satisfy. We can bow our heads, and maybe in the words of that song that we just sang, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. Let me stand. Let those who I am standing with. Christ's hand is always there for us. There's always a fine balance when speaking and preaching truth in love. We can neither reduce the severity and consequences of sin, nor understate the power and forgiveness and grace of God. 
For you and I this morning, we are called to follow him, to be attentive to our own lives, how we live, how we pray and read scripture, how we share our hope for the future with others, how we care for the earth, for our neighbors, for our difficult relatives. And having done that and spoken when we are able, in short, lived our faith each day. We are to trust our salvation and the salvation of those we love to an all-knowing and all-loving God. To believe that the one who came to save, to share in his body and his blood. And we continue in John's gospel today in the discourse. Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. These are polarizing words. These are words that are so offensive to the Jewish people who are listening in the synagogue when he speaks. Up to this point, maybe some of the crowd were hanging around, still thinking they were gonna get some more bread, but now a decision has to be made. To his Jewish listeners, this was blasphemous. Leviticus says, the Lord said to Moses, if any one of the house of Israel or the aliens who reside among them eats my blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut that person off from the people for the life of every creature. Its blood is its life. So what did our Lord mean? What was he talking about? There are different interpretations. Was it purely spiritual? The word for eating in uh, John's Gospel, certainly in the translation in, in Greek, is munching down and chewing. I remember someone in one congregation telling me that she was, she was taught never to bite down on the wafer because she would be chewing on Jesus. But that's exactly what John is saying, what Jesus is saying, bite down. This is food to eat. This is life-giving. But what about this drinking his blood? What could that mean? There's a story told about King David, a time when they were fighting the Philistines and um, the Philistines had occupied Bethlehem and he says out loud how he would love to drink the water of the well in Bethlehem. And some of the three of his, his very loyal men broke through the lines, got to the well, got some water for him and brought it back. But when David received that water, he wouldn't drink it. He declared that to drink it would be to, to effectively drink the blood of the men who had risked their lives for him. He wouldn't, and he poured the water into the ground. But Jesus not only risked his life, he gave his life. He gave his life and his blood poured into the ground and says, if you want to profit from this, you must drink my blood and eat my flesh. This is not cannibalism, an objection that's persisted over the centuries, but instead a glimpse of the promise that those who believe in Jesus have eternal life because he gave his life. He gave his flesh and blood that we might live. And in order to be truly united with him, for us to live in him and him in us, we come to the Eucharist to chew down his flesh and drink his blood. Over the summer, I visited several churches, and at one of them, the bread had been very neatly cut into cubes, and we were given them with a pair of tongs. At another one, we were, wine was poured in those little plastic cups, and then you went down and sat and drank from it. And the words that came to mind were sanitary and solitary. <laughs> At my home church in Toronto, they, they, we gather around the altar, each group comes and forward and nobody leaves until everybody's received. The bread is baked by a faithful parishioner and it's ripped apart and the crumbs go on the ground and they go in the cup and it's really a, a mess. But it seems to me that this messy eating and drinking is exactly in keeping with what we're doing here. It wasn't neat and sanitized, it was a bloody mess, a body ripped apart and blood and water pouring to the ground. Those who eat my flesh and blood abide in me and I in them. I think sometimes we distance it, it becomes very clean and we don't want to get any germs. 
We're eating the body and blood of Christ and it is life-giving. So maybe you say, well, can anyone receive? Does it matter whether we believe or not? Does it matter who gives us the bread and the wine? What words are spoken? If I drink the wine and the bread, does that mean I'm in, whether I believe or not? There was a time in my misspent youth, and yes, I know you'll find it hard to believe, but I had a misspent youth. And occasionally I would receive communion from my father. He'd become a priest in my 20s, and I did not believe in his God. And taking communion felt to me like a hollow ritual. In fact, I actually hated doing it. But oh, how that changed when years later, I gave my messy life to Christ. I didn't really have a clue what I was doing. I just knew that I could not resist the love that was being offered. Come as you are, and I will teach you my ways. I will hold your hand whatever you face. I will give you new and everlasting life. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And he is, and he is, and he is. I made that decision to follow Jesus 25 years ago, and never once, never once have I regretted it. But what I have realized is just how worthy, I, how unworthy I was and am. And I stand before you in God's grace, as does every other priest stand at the pulpit and the altar. For all have sinned and gone astray. None of us is worthy. Your reception of Christ's body and blood at the altar is not determined by my faith, by the faith of other priests, by the faith of Ben. It is determined by your faith. And we gather each week and we receive by faith, albeit a shaky one at best. A German philosopher once wrote that man is what he eats, intending this statement to put an end to idealistic speculations about human nature, but unwittingly expressing the most religious idea of man. So writes Alexander Schwiemann in his wonderful book, For the Life of the World. He writes that in Genesis, God created man, created humans, and they were hungry. We were a hungry bunch. The food that we eat, the world of which we partake in order to live is in communion with God. And he says that centuries of secularism have failed to transform eating into something strictly utilitarian. He calls it the last natural sacrament of family and friendship. Now, I love to go out for dinner with my husband. Now we can enjoy fish and chips by the sea out of the piece of newspaper. But what I really love is the white tablecloth and the flowers and the candles. And maybe we do the same thing too. And we have a special occasion. We want to show people you're important. We pull out all the stops, don't we? And we bring out the china or whatever it is you have. And we do the very best. And we do that here. We don't have to but we do because we love our Lord. The altar gilt polishes and cleans and prepares and irons those tablecloths. The flower gilt put out the flowers every week behind the scenes. They do the very best because that is what we want to offer because it matters that we say, Lord, we come in communion today to gather together. You are the heartbeat, the living word, the life work blood of this world and of every faith-filled community. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, said our Lord. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. Amen. I invite you to stand if you are able as we say the words of the Nicene Creed on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer or printed in your bulletin. We declare our faith as we say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to stand or to kneel for the prayers of the people. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Catherine, our presiding bishop, Michael, our presiding bishop-elect, Shannon, Susan and Ted, our bishops, Ben, our rector, Lynn, our priest associate, for St. James Episcopal Church and School, for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this town, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, for all teachers, administrators, students, and parents, as they begin a new year, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, especially Jessica, Robin, Adam, Francis, Jennifer, Fred, Edith, Marissa, Bert, Everett, Chad, Ian, Barrett, Anne, Kelsey, Joe, Michael, Danny, Allison, Stephen, Kay, Dave, Bill, Alexis, Landon, Debbie, Chris, and Caleb. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of resurrection, Craig Salisbury and Cammie Fuller's mother, Kathy, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation for the members of our armed forces, especially Madden, Madeline Blodgett, Ryan, Rick, Helen, 
Emery, Todd, Ian Dressel, James, Bryce Duby, Tom Spector, their families, and all deployed in harm's way. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope without suffering and without reproach. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. In the communion of St. James's and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another in all our life to Christ our God. O Lord, Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your peoples. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So we turn to page 360. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful Lord, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all of your sins. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning again and welcome. As I said, we're delighted that you are here. And uh, if you are visiting with us, please let yourself be known so that we can say hi personally to you. Um, I'd, I do want to mention the, we prayed for uh, um, Kathy, Cami Fuller's mother, and for uh, Craig, who is Pam Moffat's um, nephew. The, uh, Craig's funeral will be this afternoon at Moses and um, Cami's mother will be on Tuesday at one o'clock here at the church. Um, so I invite your prayers for them. Um, Father Ben will be back next week. I believe he's officially back on Tuesday. So I ask you to just give him a couple of days, you know, to kind of move on in, you know, before you go to him with all the terrible things that have happened while he's been away. <laughs> and I ask that you would continue to pray for him and his family um, as they enjoy their rest together. For the women's group, I want to say that uh, next week on Tuesday, we will be looking at the psalm, Psalm 34, and Linda's going to be leading us in that. So Psalm 34, um, we'll be looking at next Tuesday. As I mentioned at the 8 o'clock, there was much building going on over the weekend, and Dorothy is going to come and share a little bit about that with us now. Thank you. Uh, was amazing. Um, 
you, Dorothy. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Our service continues with Eucharistic Prayer A, found on page 361. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. <laughs> 